and you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So this morning, if you are weary from the week, if you are just tired, I believe God wants to encourage you again, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Lord, thank you that you are the one who carries us. You are the one that began the work in us. In spite of our best efforts, we often fall short. God, we come before the throne of grace yet again this morning. Lord, shower us with your mercy, with your kindness. Lord, bless your people this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's sing.
please have a seat. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jay Kim, the Ian Pastor here. I hope you're growing in your relationship with God during these times. I just want to, um, uh, it was yesterday, but I just want to uh, say thank you for those who served. Yesterday was Veterans Day. I know there's a few of you guys who were in the armed forces. Thank you for your sacrifice, for your time protecting this country. Um, and so I want to give you guys all the props and, uh, that you guys deserve. Hopefully you guys got a free, free meal yesterday as well, okay? A lot of the restaurants had a free meal. Also, just real quick, college, the Bible study this Wednesday. Young adult, if you have a uh, Bible study as well, if you have any questions, their, Bible, uh, their family groups on Friday. And I got, uh, this is important. Agape, we have a f- um, meeting this Sunday. I'm sorry, this Saturday at 5 p.m. at the church. At 5 p.m., Agape uh, will give you a, a reminder through our group chat. Also, Agape Men, this Friday, have a 7 p.m. meeting at, um, and, and facilitated by John Shen. And so please, uh, uh, if you have not been part of this, please, you can talk to him, and he can add you to our group. Also, um, um, for those who are EM, EM elders, Phil, <laughs> we have a congregational meeting today at 1230 upstairs. Uh, this is important because... They look over the budget and everything. You know, one of the good things about the Presbyterian Church, uh, when it comes to budget, salaries, and everything, it's all open. Anyone can see it. So you can see that I make over $300 million a year, okay? And so that's a great thing about the Presbyterian. It, does, it just openly tells you exactly where the money that you guys have given goes to. Also, I, I think she's going to be going to Morocco, so any Shen, okay? She's going to go to Morocco. Uh, pray for her safety, but also... I. My prayer, my, maybe it's just my dream, hopefully it's not. Our, our, our dream, hopefully, is to go to Morocco, as a team, to go to Morocco one day. Because they need the Lord. And, uh, and so it would be great. She's going to kind of be like our Caleb, kind of like our spy, in a sense, to see what kind of ministry opportunities we have in the great country in Morocco. Now, at this time, we're going to have a time of offering. We have a time of offering at this time. Father, we know that you have given us the most beautiful gift. You give, you gave your all, your son, your only begotten son. We thank you so much, Father, that you put a spirit in us, the Holy Spirit, to have that same sense of giving. May we always be a giving people for the works of your kingdom here on earth. Thank you so much. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you could all stand up at this time. Let's join together in confessing our faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day, He rose again from the In the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. Knowing that we've all sinned and fall short of God's glory, let us confess our sins to God together in silence at this time. Friends, believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. In him we're forgiven. Amen. Father God, we thank you so much that even before the foundations of the world, the cosmos, the universe, you chose us, you loved us, you knew us. We thank you for that great truth. And we thank you for the promise that as sons and daughters of God, the Most High King, that one day we will shine like you, be in radiance like you, and rule the cosmos. We thank you so much for the word of God, the major means by which we can communicate with you. The word of God is enduring, is everlasting. Father, I pray our church will be known to love your word, be rooted in your word. I pray that thy word be in our hearts and our soul and guide the way we look at life and live life. Well, Lord, we continually thank you for all the blessings that you showered upon us the many times that you've come through when we were at our darkest. We know, Father, in the valley, you are there. In the depths, you are there. You are always there. When we cry out, you are there. We thank you so much for being our mediator, the great high priest who could sympathize with all of our weaknesses. We continually pray for those who are going through tremendous pain, emotional, relational, physical pain around the world, but in our church as well. We pray for hope to be instilled in such a world that has so much violence. We know that there's no hope unless there's recon reconciliation between us and you. We know, Father, that one day you will make everything right, that the justice of God, the mercy of God will be fully here on earth. We also thank you for the prayer, the, the prayer that we all model all of our prayers. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For and it's long, okay, it's going to be short. But the greater surprise is we, uh, I don't know if you know, but we have a, a family that first visited maybe 14 months ago or something like that. And um, they're from North Ridgeville, North Ridgeville, Ohio. And they adopted two beautiful uh, Korean boys. And they've gone through a four-year four journey. Okay, four-year journey. And, uh, and so today I'm also going to take a break from Acts. I'm going to do a, a short 15-minute sermon on, uh, on adop adoption as well. And so their name is uh, Dan and Jenny. They have three beautiful daughters. Um, their names are Miss Thompson, Miss Thompson, Miss Thompson. I don't know their last name. Okay. And their son is Ungi and De Deun. Deun. Okay. And so without any further uh, delay, let's, let's welcome them. Okay. Well, good morning. And, and thank you for letting us share our story, um, our experience, how we chose to uh, grow our family through adoption. Um, Jenny and I have been married for 19 years. Uh, Pastor already said we have five kids together. 
um, and we started this process in 2017. Um, then I'll let her kind of kick off what we experienced through adoption. Um, so like Pastor Che had said, we um, have three biological daughters, and I'll give you their names, Alyssa, Eva, and Bree. And when we were pregnant with Bree, um, that actually was, I don't want to say the start of this adoption journey. I believe that God had already placed us in our, in our lives to do together long before this. But it kicked off with her because um, while we were pregnant with her, it was a very, very joyous time. But at the same time, it was full of heart, heartbreak because um, Bree was actually a twin, and we lost the twin during the pregnancy. And then after that, it was doors closed and closed and closed with trying to grow our family. Um, so it was a lot of heartbreak in asking for healing and questioning, is this, is this what God has for us? Is, you know, are we to raise these beautiful girls and have this family, or is there more? And just knowing in my heart I felt more. Um, Dan was actually the first one to suggest adoption. So we, we tried many different things, and he goes, well, you know what? Um, that doesn't have to be it. Maybe we're supposed to adopt. And the one thing that he said that he doesn't remember, and every time we say it, he goes, I don't know. But um, I believe God was already placing that seed for us to adopt internationally through a comment that he maybe didn't even remember. And he said, wouldn't it be just so much fun to have a little Korean kid running around? And I thought it was like, what? <laughs> like, that is so random of <laughs> everything. Just to like, okay. Um, but then going through the process and finally getting to the point where um, God was really talking to me specifically. He was like, yes, this nudge of you are supposed to adopt, but not just adopt, you are supposed to adopt internationally, which, you know, was a struggle for me at first to admit to him that he was right. <clears throat> but, no, as usual, no. But also with that was um, something God had to work on me is I like to feel stability. So there was a sense of not having that stability of the unknown, um, how much more expensive it is to adopt internationally than it is domestically, and then not getting to really meet, well, not getting to meet your child until either day of custody or maybe being lucky to meet once before. So there was this, this sense of just having to trust. So finally, when I admitted to to admit to Dan that this is what we we're supposed to do. I'm also a researcher. I'm a teacher, and so that's something I did, and it, I kept being brought back to this one international agency, which is Holt, and they started international adoption. Um, they're the, the founders of it, and they founded it in starting with Korea at the displacement of children during the Korean War, and that really spoke to me that I'm supposed to go back to the beginning. We're supposed to go back to the beginning in our faith, and we're supposed to go back to the beginning of what he has for us. So that led us to choose Korea and to choose adopting through Holt and to start the process. And so we started the process in um, 2017 and led into 2018. And it wasn't that much longer after we started working with Holt that we saw our, our older son, our first son's picture for the first time. And um, it was very interesting because we were able to decide you know, how will, we, how will we navigate through this process? And Dan and I had chosen specifically <clears throat> to adopt a child who was considered on the waiting child list. So that, that meant um, in the adoption world, a child who was harder to place for different things, different reasons. And when I saw his picture for the first time that next Sunday at service, felt this amazing just movement of God saying you are to pursue Dayun, and we didn't know his name at the time. At the time, it was just a, it was Dylan. We didn't know his Korean name, <clears throat> and you're supposed to pursue him as I pursue you. Dan was working security at the time at our church, so I texted him like, "We're supposed to go after. We're supposed to try," and he, all his response was, "Okay." So, <laughs> like, all right, just trusting me. But we did. We immediately said, you know, we would like to be considered. What do we need to do? And started that process um, with Dayun and ended up being um, considered. We were, we were interviewed on his first birthday. Um, and two days later, we found out that we were the family that had chosen to be his match and started the travel process. 
Yeah, so um, then, the, then the tedious, long, long, you think you, 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 we get matched and we're like, oh, we're going to hit the ground running. Let's go get this little kid and bring him home. It takes forever. It's, it's tough to wait and to go through that. However, it, it, it's a good thing. You, it helps you prepare. It helps you pay for it. Um, so even though we started at the end of 2017, we didn't finish that first adoption until the end of 2019. Um, and uh, so it, the first adoption, it was just the two of us. We didn't know what to expect. We had, we had, kinda, uh, we had friends that had, had lived in Korea before. Um, they gave us some, some tips. So for that, that first adoption, it was just the two of us that went. So we, we traveled to Korea in October of 2019. We stayed for a couple weeks. We met him a couple times. We went to the court. Um, and then they tell you, okay, go back to America and wait some more. No one, we're going to be traveling back. It could be a month. It could be two months. So we, um, we ended up coming home and waiting, and we get, we get the announcement that we get to go back. So again, it was just the two of us. And we go back, and some things that we experienced in that, that first, first trip was um, getting to know Damon's foster parents, um, specifically his foster mom. Um, especially if anyone knows anything about adoption, for the most part, you're not supposed to know um, or, or continue your relationship post-adoption. They don't want you to be doing that. However, they snuck us their information, and after we talked about it and prayed about it, we decided they want to have a part of Dan's life, so we're going to allow that con to continue. We'll ease into it. Um, so I'll, I'll let Jenny share a story of what we thought was going to be a very exciting day for us with um, the custody exchange. Uh, you know, we're going and we're going to take custody of him. We're expecting to become, um, it, it's going to be this, this joyous occasion where he's going to run into it, our arms and be like, ah, we're family now. You have that in your mind. That is not what happens. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know why we expected that. He's two years old, and um, I'll let you explain that story. <laughs> Uh, well, before I do that, the one thing I'm going to say is our, I believe with Dayun's adoption, God showed up in dates. So <clears throat> when we had decided to adopt, it was the summer he was born, and we didn't realize. Then we also um, were matched or had our interview on his first birthday, and then our custody date actually landed on our 15-year anniversary. So um, that was God confirming how much he truly loves us and Dayun, that he's showing his love in such a tangible way. Um, so we went in already like, feeling strong about our marriage, knowing that you know, we're bringing this little boy into our hearts. But then it was also the reality of how hard love can be. Because on that day, we well, um, visiting, getting to know him, we got to, like he said, get to know the foster mom, and she's a beautiful, beautiful person. Um, one of the most loving people that I think I've ever met, ever. And I still respect her so highly. So we, we got to go in and she's telling us how much she respects us and thanking us for loving Dayun already and how good she feels about him going to our family. And, um, and then custody, she can't stop touching him. She can't stop hugging him. And then, you know, in turn, us as well. But realizing that for her, this is the last tangible moment that she might ever get to hold him. She might ever get to love him. And she has been taking care of him since he was 16 days old. So, um, so seeing heartbreak, truly break, and then seeing Dayun's heartbreak in turn when he was with us, um, getting him to the taxi and holding on to him, but his foster mom still reaching in for that last hug and allowing that to happen and knowing that that is, that's what we knew we could give her at that moment was that last, that last moment with him. And um, so when we came back to the hotel, it was not easy for Dayun. He did not want us. He didn't want our comfort. He didn't want our love at that moment. Um, he wanted his oma and his appa, who he knew, and um, 
and we had to allow for his heart to break and for us to be there however God wanted us to be there to mend it and some of it was just allowing him to be angry and then being there to hold him when he was ready or um, when he could finally speak more to us letting him tell us what he was feeling and knowing that it wasn't because he didn't want our love he was missing someone's love that some another way that he had been loved that God had shown him love and so we had decided through all of this that, you know, we're not fighting for Dane's heart. To He is able to um, uh, video chat with them and has a great relationship with them, which led into our second adoption and how God truly formed this family in a very unique way. It's not the Thompsons, it's us, and we also have a Korean family that God has brought in. So we were meant to adopt Dan, but also become part of a much larger family that we had no idea going in that was part of God's plan at all. Yeah, I think you'll see some pictures with, um, you know, two older Koreans and, and some other younger couples our age and their kids. So that's that's Dingman's foster family that we, the second trip we went back, we had the opportunity to go on vacation with them. We were there for a much longer time. During COVID, we went and just stayed for two months um, and just lived in Seoul because it, it, it was difficult to get in and out of the country. But then, so I guess we'll fast forward a little bit of, of the story about Ungi. Uh, Jenny and I got back on the plane and um, we're flying home with Dingman and we decided on the plane, okay, we're gonna do it again and we're going to make sure that we have all of our kids there with us this next time that we do it. So we got home and we waited our six months that you have to wait um, to reapply to do another adoption. So we and we get rolling with that process. And while all this is going on, COVID hits. So um, we were kind of cruising along in the pro uh, in the process. Dayun was doing good. Um, we were planning on taking all the kids. We had filled all, all of our paperwork. We had gotten to the point where we were just in cruise control, just waiting to get our court date. This is October of, um, beginning of uh, 2021. Yeah, so. Congratulations, here's your court date. And it's uh, like October 20th. So I, I got about 20 days to get all of us to Korea. Um, and on top of that, I'm reading through it and I go, ah, I, I, I have to turn everything in within, within three days because you have to file for quarantine exemptions. Um, I'm sure many of you know that, that stuff. So I had three days to, to, to book, book a, a, rent an apartment, get flights, do all these things. And then I'm going through and I'm like, we don't have Dingman's passport yet. We've been waiting months to get this kid's passport. We don't have it. And my heart's sinking. It was our goal to make sure all of our kids went through this experience and, and saw the good and the bad and the tough that we experienced the first time. So I'm driving home and I'm thinking, if this is, this is gonna be one of those miracle stories. I'm gonna pull in, his passport will be in the mailbox and We'll all hug and it's going to be great. That is not what happened. So I pull in. It's not in there. I go in the house and I'm talking to Jenny. And I, I kind of had just given up. I was like, well, I guess, he, you know, it's unfortunate he can't go. Like, I don't see how we're going to get his passport within, by, by Monday morning when we have to turn all this stuff in. And um, Jenny just says that's not an option. 
You yeah, that's get exactly it done. What I said. I'm like, no, <laughs> we have to do it. So, any anyone that any any guy that's married, you know, the kryptonite of your wife crying. You'll do anything <laughs> to fix that. So, I'm like, all right, well, let's figure this out. So, by now it's like 4 p.m. on a Thursday, and I'm I find how you can get an expedited passport online, and so I I call up um, the federal government, whatever office it is. And I go, okay, hey, I, uh, I need a passport for my son. I've already sent all this paperwork in. We're waiting on it. But I gotta, I gotta, I'm going to Korea, and I need it. And, and she goes, okay, that's great. Um, you just have to pay an extra fee. We'll set you an appointment. But you have to prove that you're, you're leaving the country within 72 hours. And I, I, I lied. I go, yeah, I'm leaving the country within 72 hours. <laughs> and the lady's like, well, okay, give us your flight confirmation number because we're going to check it. And I go, all right. Um, I don't have that with me right now. I have to call you right back. So, <laughs> so now the game's on. And this is how much we wanted our kids to go to Korea with us. So especially Daeyoo. We didn't know if we are going to get another opportunity to have him go and, and reunite with his foster family. So I go online and I buy two tickets to Korea. Me and, me and Dayoon are going. I, fake tickets. And I actually bought them, but um, we weren't planning on going in two days. And I call her back. Here's my flight confirmation number. Um, I'd like an appointment. I live in Cleveland. And she goes, okay, I have one appointment left. It's in Houston, Texas tomorrow morning at 9. <laughs> and I, I go, well, I've gone this far, so I'll take it. And I, uh, I tell Jenny, I said, let's figure out how do you get to Houston. So I, I go back online. I buy two tickets to Houston. Luckily, that was pretty easy. There was a flight leaving from Hopkins. And um, at this point, it's the evening, I have no paperwork. Like, it gives you the list. You need this, this, this. It all has to be originals. I don't have any of that. That's already been sent in to the federal government. So I, um, I don't even have the paperwork in my house. I do all this at work. So I, I drive into Cleveland. I, I make copies of what I can. I'm filling out paperwork. Come home, and it gets to be about 10. I'm packed. I'm going to be leaving in a few hours, and something's eating at me, and I can just feel it. We're praying about it. I, I don't know what, what's going on, and I reread the paperwork. And it says both parents need to be present to get the passport. And now I'm like, oh, no. Or, so I reread it, reread it, or you can have this form notarized. So at 11 o'clock, I'm printing out another form. I'm calling up notaries. Luckily, I get my mom woken up. I get her over to the house. We get this filled out, checked off. We're on a flight to, uh, to Houston the next day. And um, to wrap it up, I'd never been no, so nervous in my life. I have anxiety. I'm, I'm standing in line at the federal building. I've been a police officer 20 years. I know the signs of human trafficking. And I'm, I'm standing with this little boy that doesn't look like me. And I'm sweating. I'm breathing heavy. I, I was so nervous. I was so nervous. And, and I'm like, Some, somebody's going to pull me out and interrogate me. It, it didn't end up happening. We ended up being there all day long. I... I explain the situation to the lady at the window and about five hours later we ended up getting the passport it was it, it was a total total god thing it, it 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 was tough we managed to figure it out but that's just like a, a little like of the intensity that we felt that all of our kids are going to be present and experience this yeah so then we get the passport uh, dan starts with the quarantine exemptions we do what we have to do um we think we're good at that point. Like, okay, like that was a huge hurdle. We're leaving in, gosh, at that point, like 15 days. And um, then our youngest daughter, Bree, um, started to not feel very well. So then she has COVID. <laughs> then, so this was one where it was like, oh my gosh, you know, so I mean, she, she, <laughs> we were like, I'm sorry, but you have to stay in your room, kid. Like, <laughs> We have to try to figure this out. Um, at the time, it was like, okay, we still have 15 days. It could, you know, we'll go so far, we'll test again. Um, but it got to, um, I don't remember how close it was to us leaving. The last opportunity she could take a test and then be able to fly. And it came back positive. So we then, during all of this, um, I kept thinking, like, no, you know, it's going to be fine. God wants us all there. I know that we're all going to get there. So it's going to be okay. But we kept, like, we, we kept taking tests <laughs> until that last one. And when it came back as positive, I 
again, started crying. I probably cried like 50 times that month. But um, I cried because it was that thought of, like, you're, we're leaving one behind. We have to go to make this court date. Like, we, we can't not go to court. And we both have to go. And um, so then we ended up leaving. Um, Dan told Bree, don't worry. Well, I'll be back. You're going to get there. Um, we're going to get that negative test, and then I will come back and bring you to us. Knowing that sometimes you can test positive for, what, like 90 days or whatever after, like, you have COVID. I don't, but it was like thinking like, oh, God, you've got, you've really got to come and help our daughter. So we go, we get to Korea, and we're there for maybe a week, and then she tests negative. So, but we still have to make our court date, so it still is waiting. But in that moment of not knowing and being without her, we, we really felt incomplete. Our family was incomplete. And the experiences we had did not feel the same without her. But on the flip side, looking at what God was doing, our community took care of Brianna. When she was at school, her classmates took care of her. Um, her teacher took care of her. Family and friends took care of her in a way that blew us away. Um, and then when she was ready to go and Dan made it back from Korea, back to the United States um, to get her, had to stay for about a week. Then you had to do your COVID test again and reapply for quarantine exemptions and then come. When she finally landed in Korea, her teacher said when her classmates saw her picture, they clapped and cheered. They were so excited to see her where she needed to go and what she was going to experience and happy that she was on this journey with us. And we could not wait for them to finally come to our apartment. <laughs> when we were finally all together, it was just like, oh, we're finally here. And, um, but in that time period, she missed meeting her brother for the first time. She missed the experience of the Korean court. But, um, but Holt did allow for us to have one additional meeting with Ungi so Brie could still meet him. And that was so special just to have everybody together in one room for the very first time was like, that was, that was awesome. But. Yeah, not only was, was Bree taken care of while we weren't here, um, oh. when I, I, I had to leave my family and come get Bree and, and everyone's in, in Korea. Um, and, and luckily we had family there that took care of, of Jenny and the girls and Dayoon because uh, Dayoon's parents came over every day, took care of Jenny, made sure she's fed. We, she knew how to get around. So we were definitely taken care of the entire time. Yeah, it was a great experience. After that, we got to, um, we took custody of, of Ungi towards the end of um, November. And she was off of work. I, I had another four weeks of leave. And we just, we, we had the apartment for another um, three weeks. So we just stayed in Korea for the next three weeks and hung out. It was a great experience. Um, loved the culture, loved the country. So, and the girls, I did ask them what were their favorite things were because they, they were like, we're too nervous to talk. So Brianna, our youngest, said that um, McDonald's french fries taste different. <laughs> so she likes that. And there was at one of the markets, I don't know if you've seen on Netflix, the, um, the Korean street food, I forgot what is it, Street Food Asia maybe. Um, we call her the noodle lady. We ate probably at her stand like five times because our kids loved it so much, and we did too. So it was cool to watch the episode and then see that was Bree's favorite. Um, Alyssa said she was super proud of herself because she learned how to navigate the subway better than Dan. Anytime that we got lost, Dan was in charge, mm -hmm. but Alyssa kept us on track. And then Eva's favorite thing was food. She loved trying food, and, um, and her favorite is tteokbokki. That was her favorite. So, um, and then Dayun and Ungi, just everything about the culture they love. So, um, oh, Eva also, she, pro she chose the one activity that I did not think that we were going to like as much as we did, was going to one of the palaces and renting Hanbox, and um, loved it, even Dan. I think there's a picture of him in a Hanbox somewhere mm -hmm. streaming. Oh, there they are. 
Um, yeah, uh, so Eva chose that, and we all really enjoyed it. So even just like stepping out and trying new things, they learned so much during that time away, and I give them a lot of credit because God taught them compassion during custody. Um, the heartbreak, they even said that was the hardest moment was custody, seeing the heartbreak and then it mending and experiencing that with Ungi's foster mom, um, but also online schooling. Like They had their challenges as well that God showed up for, so he really did come, come through with our entire family. And so our lessons with this truly were that from one process to the next process, to all the hurdles that we've had adoption-wise and not, that God is faithful and that he loves his children. And he will show up even in moments where you're, you're not sure that he's going to show up. He does show up. And sometimes you see it way after when you are done hurting, but he, he really is there through every step and does bring you through. <laughs> I just one question for you guys. Is there anything you want to tell us how, how, as a church, you can maybe help you guys or help your five kids, you know, any, anything that, yeah. yeah. Um, like you guys as a church? Yeah. First of all, how, how did you even come to church? How did you even know about our church? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So, um, so we happen to meet another Korean adoptee, an adult Korean adoptee at a wedding. And he, at the time, was directing an Asian adoptee camp in Avon and just mentioned, like, hey, you should come check it out. So we became friends with him. So that summer we, we did search. We're like, yeah, any way that we can find culture to continue for our family we will do that. So we went, and we happened to go on the evening that your church was providing the meal for this Korean camp, and members from your church invited us. So we got connected that way and decided, like, yeah, we're going to give it a try. We're, gonna, we're going to go and check this out and see how we can get plugged in. And um, even though we're members at another church, we still want our boys to experience this community and this culture, and we've come to really love this church as well. So... Um, so we've been coming for over a year, a couple times a month, and have really enjoyed getting to know everybody. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, this is incredible. They they told even a greater de uh, depth depth and length during one of our agape meetings at their house, but their house is like Disney World North. It's huge. And, um, but I hope you get to know uh, their, their five beautiful kids, get to know Dan and Jenny. Uh, they're a beautiful girl. They've been, they just came out of, they're like manna, manna from heaven. They just came. Like, who are you coming to our church? And it's, they've, they've blessed us the last 14 months. I hope you guys get to know them. Thank you so much for blessing us today. This will not be a 15-minute sermon. This will be like an eight-minute sermon, okay? All right. Let's turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 through 14. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him, before the creation of the world, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he pre predestined us for adoption, to sonship through Jesus Christ, in, according, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have a redemption, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. I'm going to stop there today, okay? Um, like I said, I'm not going to talk about acts. I'm going to talk about adoption today. I think a perfect sedge way. Um, you know, in verse 4, it says this. We were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. That word, that word world is not just this world. It's, work, it's the universe. You know, this is an awesome thought, right? Before the universe was even established, God knew you and loved you. Okay? There's never been a time in eternity when God did not know you and love you. Okay? For as long as, you know, if, as long as God has been in existence, which is forever, he has known about you, 
cherish you, and plan to redeem you and to save you. You know, sometimes people take this verse, means that God simply just knew beforehand who would cho choose him. As he would look at down the corridors of the future and say, oh, I see that Che would choose you. Che will love you. So I choose him back. That's not what this verse says. It says he set his love on us. He chose us before we were even a twinkle in our daddy's or mommy's eyes, okay? And so from verse 3 to verse 14, it talks about this whole salvation process. In this passage, there's 24 verbs, 24 action sequences. 20 of them are all gods. Four of them is what we do. Out of the 24 verbs, 20 are gods, four is us. This, this is all we do. We listen, we receive, we believe, and we hope. That's our job. We listen, we receive, we believe, and we hope. Isn't that beautiful? So what part of salvation are we responsible for? He does all of the work. He does all of the, all of the saving. We do all the sinning, okay? And so here's the question. Why did he choose me? Why did he choose you? Was it my potential? <coughs> Was it, did God look at me? God look at Steve? God look at Phil and said, I got to have that guy on my team? Is that the reason? Is it because they have great potential? Not at all. In one of the most mystifying, beautiful passages in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7 to 8, he said this, The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you are more numerous than other people, for you are the fewest of all people. Basically saying, I didn't choose you, Israel, because you were great. You became great because I chose you. And Deuteronomy 9, 6 says this, It's not because of your righteousness that the Lord God is giving you this good land to possess, for you are a stiff-necked people. Okay? So he's not saying it's because of our goodness or our righteousness that he chose us. In chapter 2, we don't have time. It says that we were dead in our trespasses. Listen, dead is dead. I don't care if you watch Princess Bride. There's not mostly dead, half dead. Dead is dead. Okay? And so there's no such thing as mostly dead. You're either dead or not. And so God didn't choose us because we're lovable. In fact, in chapter 2, it says that we were actually God's enemies, sons of disobedience, objects of his wrath. And so I know some of us, we, we, we you know, we rationalize. Yeah, I made some mistakes, but I'm a pretty good guy. You know, don't we say that all the time? Yeah, I made mistakes. I'm pretty lovable. Well, you are underestimating how disgusting sin is. This is what Jonathan Edwards says. The slightest sin has an infinite amount of hatefulness in it, enough to outweigh whatever loveliness the creature possesses. The slightest sin has an infinite amount of hatefulness in it, enough to outweigh whatever loveliness the creature possesses. There are loveliness about all of us, but our rebellion is so hideous, it outweighs any good that we do, okay? So what then? What, so why did he choose us? And that's the, that's the great mystery. In Deuteronomy 7, it says, it's not because you're more numerous. It's, it's because I, I loved you. I set my love on you. He doesn't give a reason why. He's kind of redundant. He loves you because he loves you. Listen, those who are parents, you understand this. Fatherly, motherly love. Okay? Think about your own kids. I don't love them because they're so great, because they're so lovely. They might be. I just love them. Do you understand? I just love them. Okay? It's not, it's not. Before the foundation of the universe, he loved this We should all perish. We should all be separated from God.
from verse 5, he says, he We're rebellious kids, but he says, I will make you mine. And he did that joyfully. In verse 5, the word purpose is translated in the Greek actually means kind intention. It means that the whole process of adoption, of salvation, he enjoyed this process. He went through a process of six years, and it cost him everything, the blood of his own begotten son, to accomplish it, Okay. Now, I've seen some people who've adopted, and one of the things that they all tell me is this, that when, you, when they walk into the nursery and see the one who's going to be their child, immediately your heart wells up in love. It just and immediately says, they are mine. They are mine. That's just a foretaste of the kind of love that God has for each of you. And so God walked into the orphanage of sin, deformed by sin, and love welled up in his heart, and he said, he is, he is mine. She is mine. Listen, that is our ultimate identity. Do you understand that? Your ultimate identity is not a father or a mother or a husband and wife. Your ultimate identity is that you're a son and daughter of the Most High King, our God. That is our primary identity. He predestined us to be sons and daughters of God. That is his capstone. And actually, the whole point of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection is for us to be adopted. That is the apex. That's what the whole gospel is all about. That is the highest thing that Christ can offer to the world for us to be adopted as sons. Now listen, some of you guys are thinking, what about daughters? Do they not get adopted as well? Okay, first of all, let's not get all bent out of shape about metaphors. But let's focus on the truth behind the metaphors. Sonship here means the same for women as well. Like you men, do you get mad when Christ says that you are the bride of Christ? Do you guys get mad that you're a bride? I don't care how manly man you are. Like Dan, he is a bride. He's a bride, okay? Doesn't have all the makeup stuff, but he's the bride of Christ. That seems odd too. The metaphor is not the point. It's the truth behind the metaphor. Listen, when it comes to position and power and privilege and inheritance, he's, there's no gender differences. He's saying back then women had no power, no privilege, no uh, position. And so the rights of sonship came upon all. So the benefit of sonship came upon all humans. Capiche? Okay? So it's amazing. No other religion claims this. No other religion says that our creator is our father, that we can call him Abba. We can call the creator of hundreds of billions of galaxies daddy. No other religion says that. C Christianity is the only religion that has the audacity to say that our father, I mean, our God is our father, and he is a perfect father. He loves Ungi and Dan, Dan more than his father, foster parents, more than even Dan and Jenny. And it's the same with us. And so when it comes to adoption, this is interesting. With human adoption, we're not children by nature, right? We're children, we have a change of status. I mean, Jen and Dan, you know, Ungi and Dan, they, they have Thompson as their last name. It's a legal change, okay? But here's the thing. With God, you don't just have a change of nature, okay? I mean, you don't just have a change of status. You have a change in nature, okay? Here's the thing. The last time I checked, their two beautiful adopted sons do not look like Dan at all. They don't, know, they don't, they don't have his DNA, which is Dan kind of, yeah, that's Dan, right? Okay? Okay. It's one thing to part, is for the president to, to pardon a criminal, and you no longer will be executed or in jail. It's quite another for the king of the universe to say, you're my son and daughter, and everything I have is yours. You're giving everything that you give to your natural child, to your adopted child. The whole purpose of, of adopting a child is that you treat that child just as your natural born child. Do you understand?
And that means one day, comically, that some of you guys have had small daddies. Okay, some of you guys have small daddies. Okay, now you can actually go to a bully and say, my daddy is bigger than your daddy. Unless he also believes in God. And then both, you both have the same daddy. Okay, but here's the thing. You have the same DNA. You don't, you know, they don't, you know, no, I don't think Dayon and Unge will ever look like dad. Ever. Okay? But we have his DNA. It's called the Holy Spirit. And more and more, we are going to look like him. Gradually, one day, we will completely look like him. In Hebrews 1.3, it says the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. That means Christ looks just like his father. And I end with this. In Romans 8.22, this is incredible. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, <coughs> the redemption of our bodies. He's saying that all the creation, all of the galaxies, the whole universe is waiting, is groaning for our complete adoption. And that all of nature is going to completely transform when we are fully adopted. If you can find a better God than that, go worship him. He, their, what they went through is a foretaste of our adoption. So their, their two kids are not the only ones adopted. Every one of us who accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior has been adopted. And we will completely look like him one day. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for Dan and Jenny, for speaking first through Jenny and for her heart to be open to what you want her to do, for them to experience just a foretaste what it is to love someone unconditionally, not just their three naturally born daughters, but two sons that before the creation of the universe, you planned it, you predestined them for them to be loved by two people from North Ridgeville, Ohio. You can't even make that up. Thank you so much for this miracle and the miracle that we, you call all of us adopted sons and daughters. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand up. And worship.
who can do immeasurably more than we can say, ask, or imagine. To him be all the glory, praise, and honor. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much.